Good morning. Um, welcome to Medical Grand Rounds. Uh, in, in Dr. Fraser's absence, I'm going to introduce our speaker, and it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Hilary Reno, uh, who is Professor of Medicine in the Department of Medicine and uh, in the Division of Infectious Diseases. Hilary received her MD and PhD from the University of Illinois, and then came here to St. Louis to the medicine residency at Barnes Hospital. She became a chief resident and then a fellow in infectious diseases and uh, joined the faculty initially both in hospital medicine and in uh, infectious diseases, but more recently has uh, transferred entirely to infectious diseases. And over the course of her academic career, uh, Dr. Reno has become one of the national experts uh, in sexually transmitted diseases. She serves as an advisor to the CDC, uh, part of the uh, group that writes the guidelines for STIs, but more relevantly, she has also um, become recognized nationally as uh, for her approach to regional coordination uh, in the management of sexually transmitted diseases. Um, St. Louis is a classic example of the lack of regional coordination. Um, there are many people, unfortunately, in the county who think that uh, sexually transmitted organisms don't cross skinker. Um, and, but Hillary has really led efforts to, both at a regional and state level, to try and, and tackle uh, what is a, a growing problem uh, in our society. Indeed, her talk today will be about the resurgence of a disease that we thought we had lost. We really thought 20 years ago that the syphilis, which she will discuss, uh, was something that uh, was go going to be confined to the history books. And uh, unfortunately, that is not the case. So please join me in welcoming uh, Dr. Reno, and she discussed the resurgence of syphilis and the importance of syndromic-based care. Thank you. So there is no better day than when I get to talk about syphilis. So thanks for letting me kick this off um, this early in the morning. Um, here are my disclosure and thanks to a lot of people for some slides. Um, so we're going to talk briefly about syphilis. I'm really not going to harp on its clinical management. If you've got any questions, um, you know where to find me. Um, because we're really going to talk about why the rates of syphilis have been increasing, what are the contributing factors, and why a syndemic approach um, might be our best um, solution. So just some assumptions. Um, first of all, one I, could, I forgot to put on the slide. Um, MPOX has not gone away, so do not forget about MPOX. Um, please, thank you. Okay, now on to s general sexual health assumptions. So sexual health care is an important part of health and is often sidelined due to stigma. And we see this in a lot of different ways. We see it in the lack of attention. We see it in the jokes that are made, um, which are um, uh, perfectly appropriate. But um, at times, uh, it's you know our way of coping with those things. Um, and we see it in the lack of funding. Um, all aspects of sexual health exhibit tremendous disparities. Um, this is also probably a contributing factor, racism, to our uh, lack of attention to STIs. Um, and we need not just new methods, but really revolutionary methods of delivering sexual health care to impact our rates at this point. Um, if condoms were going to work, they would have already, and they have not. So let's think, let's think bigger. Um, I am an advocate of burning it all down and starting over again, but luckily I work with people that temper me. Um, fundamentally, all healthcare should involve an aspect of sexual health, so uh, no matter what your specialty is in here right now, uh, you need to consider the sexual health um, of your uh, patients. I, there's a former Barnes uh, resident who went on to do oncology, and her whole specialty is uh, uh, addressing human sexuality and sexual health care for patients with uh, cancers. Um, so she has made it a focus of her career. Um, we must be judicious with our efforts. So we have to put um, our disparities uh, forefront in our minds when we're making plans. And one thing that we don't do enough of is evaluation. Um, if something doesn't work, we need to stop it and move on to something else. Um, so national rates, those are the most recent ones uh, from 2022. No 
note that there's been a little decrease in chlamydia. We don't actually think that's real. We just think this is a general lack of screening or impact of the pandemic still. Um, we would love to believe that that's a act, true actual increase of infection. Um, and gonorrhea has gone up about 11%, but down in more recent years. Um, but syphilis and congenital syphilis have done the direct opposite. So you can see that really 80% increase in the last five years in syphilis and almost 180% in congenital syphilis. So T. pallidum, um, and its soaring rates have gotten some attention. That's from the New York Times. I forgot what this one's for, but it is a very good um, point that U.S. really hasn't seen these numbers since 1950. And so if you think about it, the way and when many of us trained, we were in the years when syphilis uh, was very low rates. And so we may or may not have seen um, a lot of syphilis. I remember the first case of syphilis I saw as a third year medical student. Um, it was a patient with neurosyphilis who was in the hospital for a while. Um, I don't think that's what put me on the track, but it was a very fascinating um, case. And to see this man um, still left with permanent uh, disability. And then on top of it, we're having other challenges, including drug shortages and bicillin. Pfizer's taken a lot of heat for this, as they should. Um, and we probably have, uh, in addition, all the other factors that go into play, um, meaning we have an equitable distribution of bicillin uh, through the country. Uh, we know, for example, that uh, tribal lands um, and from the Indian Health Service, um, and specifically the Great Plains um, Tribal Council, who we work with, um, have expressed their real lack of bicillin that seems out of proportion to some of the other places that we work with. Um, and just so you know, in Missouri, we do have ample uh, bicillin, so you can treat syphilis with bicillin, please. Um, so this is a really wonderful diagram when you start looking at it. Um, I love ribbon diagrams. It satisfies every bit of organizational pull I have in my life. Um, and you can see the disparities here laid out pretty clearly, except when it comes to um, uh, Alaskan Native, Native Hawaiian populations, um, where they're uh, such a lower part percentage of the population that you can't really see the uh, true disparities marked. But you can see that for African Americans, where they are 12.6% um, of uh, the population, but uh, make up 32% of primary and secondary syphilis in this country. And again, primary and secondary syphilis, we're really talking about newly acquired, newly transmitted syphilis. So that indicates active infection, not this sort of long-term um, infection that hadn't been diagnosed pr previously. So if we look uh, more to Missouri, you can see um, Missouri in orange uh, and the United States is in blue and Missouri in 2020 surpassed the U.S. average uh, for rates of all stages of syphilis. And then more recently, um, you can see where uh, we've got late latent cases that have in orange have, darker orange have increased much uh, higher rate than the early uh, and second, primary and secondary syphilis. And so some people have suggested that this could indicate maybe the pandemic prevented people from getting tested and screened. I'm going to, for once, take an optimistic view and say that it's, it could be because we're getting the word out and people are doing more testing and finding these late latent cases that hadn't been previously diagnosed. So someone who has syphilis, 30% of them will go on to develop late latent, latent manifestations. Um, and so diagnosing those people and getting them treatment before those manifestations um, appear is very important. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, this is kind of what we're facing. And then I wanted to give some specific um, information to the region. So this is the, from the county. Um, this, is, this is from their annual report, um, and it shows the early syphilis rates among women of reproductive age and rates of congenital syphilis. So the U.S. congenital syphilis rate is in yellow. The St. Louis County congenital syphilis rate is in green. And then the St. Louis County syphilis rate among women of reproductive age is that light blue. So you can see an increase in women, which corresponds to an increase in congenital syphilis rates. And you can see where St. Louis County 2020 just kind of broke it all open. That was the case for uh, all of Missouri. The city included. The city is the same number of cases as the county does. Um, and uh, we, as when I first started practicing in sexual health care, we usually had zero to one case of congenital syphilis a year. Um, in 2022, we had over just over 80 cases in Missouri. So uh, we have about 22 in the city and the county total. Um, and I've not seen the 2023 numbers, but I think 
there were some mixed messages there. I don't know if we went up, down, or stayed level. Um, and then this maps out these um, early syphilis rates by county region. So you can see the inner north and the outer north aspects of the county. Um, and I promise, I know the city's not here. This is part of that regional cooperation we were kind of talking about um, to not have a city map to correspond to that. But um, the city, North City also has the highest rates of, the, of other STIs as well as syphilis and congenital syphilis. So um, really maps across the north. Um, so life lesson, um, over the past few years, I know we've all struggled with things. And so some of what uh, I learned in the last few years, which I wish I had learned in my 20s and 30s, but didn't, was that we only have control over certain things, right? And so um, I don't have control over everything, despite what I might think sometimes, um, as my husband would tell me. Um, but what I can say is that there are things within our control. And if we really focus on those um, and try to be productive and move the needle, that's much more satisfying than struggling with all these other issues, like federal funding. I have no control over federal funding, right? Um, so having struggling with those things is really kind of pointless when we should be putting our efforts to those things that we can control. So what I can control is ensuring and do everything I can to ensure that quality care is given to people um, with the con concerns about STIs, right? So part of that is pointing out, this is the only like truly clinical aspect of what we're going to cover today, um, but pointing out, is some, uh, pointing out some really key points to y'all who may see syphilis today or tomorrow or next week. Um, and so this is a really wonderful diagram and an article you, you all should read um, from the New England Journal an overview of syphilis. The New England Journal has then subsequently published overviews of and management of neurosyphilis and congenital syphilis. So there's a series of articles that is really fantas fantastic overviews. Um, and this really lays out the complexity of syphilis um, and why this is such a challenge for people to diagnose, to treat, to manage. Um, and just some key points here. Everyone with syphilis needs two things a full neurologic review of systems, including an assessment of their vision and hearing, and they need an assessment for pregnancy. It should be pretty obvious as to why, but to point out, you can get ocular and otic syphilis at any stage of syphilis. You can even have neurologic manifestations at any stage of syphilis. We were traditionally taught that neurosyphilis is really a late manifestation, and it can be, but we can also see it through primary, secondary, and even earlier in early years of the syphilis infections. So make sure that someone has a neurologic review of systems, and if something comes up during that, that that is investigated. The assessment of pregnancy is key because starting treatment in pregnancy as early as possible uh, helps to prevent the transmission to the fetus itself. We also must recognize that staging depends on a patient's history of test results, all right? So this requires cooperation. It requires working with your health department, with your disease intervention specialists, those are DIS or contact tracers, right? So our contract tracers can look up into the state databases and see the history of anyone's reactive RPRs. They can't see the non-reactive RPRs, which can help with staging too, um, but Care Everywhere at Epic can help with that. So make sure you look at the history of someone's syphilis tests. And then freely consult. There, again, me talking about syphilis makes this a great day. So calling me with a question or a case on syphilis will also make it a great day for me. Never hesitate to get hold of me, Joe Cheruby, Donald Hong, um, Adithi Ramakrishnan, Fulana Liang. I get, there's like a list of people now, which is great. Um, but we are happy to help. And then if we take this um, and kind of map out the treatment of syphilis, uh, you, you can see it's pretty laid out pretty clearly there. There are some additional key points. The first is to be aware of benzathine penicillin shortages. Again, in Missouri, we have plenty of benzathine, so go ahead and treat with bicillin injections. Um, but also recognize that people, there are people who must be treated with bicillin. Um, less relevant to us is pregnant people, but if you happen to see someone with syphilis uh, who's pregnant and has not been treated, please take that opportunity to treat them because we may not see them again. Um, and then I get a lot of questions about alternatives for treating neurosyphilis. Um, there is very little efficacy to use anything but IV penicillin. So if you call me, I'm going to say you need to use IV penicillin. 
okay, not ceftriaxone, although there's growing evidence for that, and that's a vi probably going to be a viable alternative soon. But right now, we're going with penicillin. Okay, good. That took care of like 50% of my consults right there. <laughs> All right, so what I really want to talk about is, um, like, what can we do, right? Uh, we're going to be action-oriented um, about the syphilis epidemic that we are faced with. And Dr. Prattley is correct. In the 2000s, there was a syphilis elimination project. Um, they planned to eliminate syphilis by 2030 uh, in the United States. And um, th that's not going to happen. Um, and the reason it's not going to happen is, is this, uh, syndemics. So what is a syndemic? So this, a syndemic is a term first coined in this article from 2000 that looked at the intersection of gang violence, HIV, and drug use in Puerto Rico. And what it discussed was how they interact. You can see like that first little figure there. Um, how they interact to make each other uh, more concerning, basically. So they're two, it's two or more disease that cluster together in time or space and then they interact in meaningful ways, usually to the detriment. Um, and they also are influenced by harmful social conditions that are driving these interactions. So I think it's easy for us to start thinking about syndemics, right? So STIs are syndemics in and of themselves. If someone has syphilis, they have an increased risk of having an HIV infection. Syphilis in uh, MSM in one study in New York City, uh, it was a mean time of 1.6 years until they had an incident HIV infection, right? So syphilis and HIV interact. Herpes, HIV interacts. Gonorrhea and chlamydia increases inflammatory uh, markers, breaks down mucosal barriers, and serves as uh, a way to facilitate HIV infection, right? So STIs are syndemics in and of themselves. But then we can start adding other things. Um, and I think what I want to use is the first case study is congenital syphilis, and then I'm going to go through four programs uh, that are launching that um, really address uh, many aspects uh, of syndemics. So first, congenital syphilis. So I'm going to give you a, a sample case. This is a real case with identifiers changed. Um, so in this case, mom had adequate prenatal care. Uh, she had all, uh, all of her visits um, and had an RPR screening test at eight weeks uh, that was non-reactive. And then at 35 weeks, she came in with vaginal lesions. Um, there's not, we didn't have a lot of description about when, um, what those were like, um, but we know that an HSV or herpes test was done that was negative. Um, no other STI testing was sent, and she was treated with val um, acyclovir, and the lesion resolved. She then came in at labor at 37 weeks. Um, no RPR testing was done at delivery. And then the baby, um, at five months old, was uh, sent for workup because of uh, slow weight gain, some developmental delay, um, some movement issues, and hip x-rays were part of that workup, indicating some periosteal abnormalities consistent with congenital syphilis. And so the baby was diagnosed with congenital syphilis at five months old. So you can think about the mistakes that were made through this course, right? I'm sure you can come up with a few. So look at the spread of syphilis in the United States from 2013 forward. The darker the state, the more cases of syphilis it had. And yeah, that's where we are now. Um, I mean, let's go back, watch it again. Look at the south. California and Texas have about 50% of the cases of, of congenital syphilis, um, but look at how the south also has high cases. And then look through the Midwest. So South Dakota actually has the highest rate right now of all states in the US because um, of the rates on um, uh, Native American land. And uh, the, again, this is, this is really concerning. Um, Navajo Nation struggled with this during, actually during the pandemic, overlap of COVID and, and syphilis. Um, and right now, South Dakota's uh, in uh, a lot of a lot of stress because of this. In addition, I can say tell you there's a full breakdown between the state of South Dakota working with um, tribal communities. The state of South Dakota has all the DIS, um, IHS, Indian Health Service does not have any contact tracers, and um, South Dakota DIS um, uh, uh, do decline to go onto tribal lands because they consider them not safe. So. And actually, actually, their governor's forbidden to go on tribal land um, 
for many reasons. So there's not a really great relationship there. Um, and that really hinders, um, hinders responding to a crisis like that. So I could go on and on about the injustices. Um, but the other contributing factors <laughs> to our congenital syphilis rates are manifested here. Um, you can see in the ribbon diagram, green represents cisgender women. Um, and uh, MSM, or cisgender men who have sex with cisgender men, uh, are represented in the maroon color. And you can see how over the years, um, cisgender women have made up a higher proportion of the primary and secondary syphilis cases in the US. Um, and really, what also makes this an even broader syndemic is uh, the association with drug use. So you can see that um, drug use has been very prominent um, in primary and second, sec uh, secondary syphilis cases. This is a study we did um, pre-pandemic um, where the, I didn't have the money to pay for the color diagram, so it's in black and white. Um, but you can see that um, the hyphenated lines um, uh, represent small metro and rural regions, and over time, from 2012 to 2018, a higher proportion of people of childbearing potential reported drug use um, uh, along with their interview for having early syphilis. Um, and the rates between um, uh, these, metropolit these small metropolitan rural counties in Missouri were 18% of people of childbearing potential reporting um, drug use compared to 8.6% in the urban areas of St. Louis and Kansas City. So um, this certainly speaks as to why um, congenital syphilis is a syndemic. And this is from Elizabeth Daniels, um, who's done a really wonderful uh, series of studies uh, using 131 dyads, I think, of mom baby pairs, um, and has showed that there are many other themes that interact uh, with patients that have babies with congenital syphilis. We see higher rates um, of unemployment, substance use, interactions with the prison system, housing instability, partner violence, sex trafficking, um, child protective services involvement, um, and they all have limited prenatal care as well as. 47% um, I think reported um, drug use, meaning meth, cocaine, or opioid use. Um, the CDC published this vital signs uh, earlier this, uh, late last year, um, and really looked at how um, the rates have gone up, but summarized it in this title up here. Syphilis and babies reflect health system failures. Um, that is true. Um, but certainly simplistic. Uh, and I appreciate, of course, I appreciate the CDC's work, um, but I do think it, it's important that we recognize how simplistic um, this algorithm, this um, uh, flow chart is, and really boiling down the non-diagnosis or not being able to treat syphilis and pregnancy resulting in congenital syphilis cases to simply testing and treatment. Right? So if you follow the 3,700 cases from 2022 of congenital syphilis in the U.S., you see that 58% um, had a timely test. And then of those, 69% had inadequate treatment, right? So this isn't just the simple story of giving someone an injection of bicillin. This is a much more complex story. There are, this is also from Elizabeth, there are also challenges there. We see provider confusion over the appropriate treatment for different stages of syphilis. We see difficulty in facilitating those three weekly doses. There's a wonderful story in the New York Times from early in the pandemic or pre-pandemic times where they follow DIS in Arizona and New Mexico. And the DIS drive out to a woman's home. She is pregnant. Her partner lives with her but the DIS is not able to deliver and inject the bicillin. She has to go to the clinic. So they offer her, that she's like, I'm gonna go, I'm going tomorrow. So they leave, she doesn't show up, they come back. They offer to drive her to the clinic, but she doesn't wanna go without her partner. So she doesn't, she declines going. They finally get her, drive her to the clinic, and the clinic says, we've reached our maximum number of patients today, we can't see her. So these are the factors that are going into why treatment doesn't happen when it should. Not to mention drug use, not having prenatal care, 
We also see a lot of difficulty with people managing penicillin allergies. Remember what I said? People with, congenital, with syphilis and pregnancy have to be treated with bicillin. Why is that? It's the only drug that reliably crosses the placental border to treat the fetus. So if someone is allergic to penicillin and they're pregnant and they have syphilis, they must be desensitized. Well, you can imagine in rural New Mexico that that's not easily available, right? We also see a lot of misunderstandings about allergies. I often hear, well, my mother was allergic to penicillin, so I was told to never take it. And then when asked, they're like, oh yeah, I got dental work and I had amoxicillin like three months ago, right? So I mean, it, it takes time. In a clinic situation, you have to be willing to ask these questions and keep digging. And then we already know syphilis drug use and other social vulnerabilities interact to increase congenital syphilis. So congenital syphilis certainly is preventable, but, and that but is a very big but, you need all of these things to fall into place. Timely prenatal care, timely syphilis testing, timely stage appropriate treatment, timely identification, because we do have treatment failure. About 4% of congenital syphilis cases are probably resulted of treatment failure. Um, and we don't understand why, so that's a lack of science that needs to happen. But we do have failure. We do have reinfection in pregnancy. That can happen, right? So, and we have seroconversions that are sometimes happening late in pregnancy, because guess what? Pregnant people have sex. It's shocking, but it's true. <laughs> Do you know OB-GYNs, the University of Chicago did the study, OB-GYNs, only 20% of them really asked about the sexual life of their patients. Their whole existence is based on sex. <laughs> Just not their whole existence. Anyway, so what do we do now? So here is what the vital sounds suge signs suggested. Screening at non-traditional, outside traditional prenatal care locations where anyone who is pregnant comes into contact with health care. Emergency departments, jails, syringe services programs, other health programs, WIC offices, for example. And they also suggest the identification of syphilis during pregnancy should be seen as a high priority for rapid follow-up. <laughs> Of course, right? So very common sense things that aren't happening. So some of, some of these things are starting to be explored. There's um, a great, uh, this study from um, University of Chicago where they're doing opt-out syphilis screening and making a dent. Um, and then again, we're kind of come back to quality care. So decreasing stigma for all STIs. That's going to impact what happens with syphilis, right? This means perhaps a transportation company that exists in an urban area that has high rates of STIs might consider putting ads that have sexually transmitted infections as words on their ads and not call it a violation of community standards. No particular urban area, no particular metro bus group. We also need access to packaged STI testing for people of childbearing potential. I cannot tell you, I'm gonna show you a graph in a second, how many people go in for their annual exam or their every three year exam and get gonorrhea and chlamydia screening but not syphilis and HIV? We must counsel pregnant people on STI prevention, which means we need to talk to patients about if you're gonna have a new partner, please use barrier protection, external, internal condoms, whatever, it, whatever you choose. Because getting an STI, we're not just talking about syphilis, getting herpes in the third trimester of pregnancy is very, very concerning for that pregnancy and outcomes. And then we need to implement syndemic care plans. So here's where I'm gonna talk about the four syndemic care plans that, um, and programs that are at various stages, um, many at the beginning, <laughs> Uh, and we'll have outcome data later, um, yeah, years down the road. So the first thing I want you to pay attention to um, on each of the slides with the puzzle piece, I have put the lead organization for the project, the funding, and any time you see CDC or in the epidemic funding, I want you to remember to vote in November. Because guess who wants to zero fund in the epidemic in the United States? They want to zero fund it, all right? Um, I probably violated like a couple like lobbying rules just there, <laughs> sorry. Um, there, there also may be an OB-GYN resident who might have a, um, uh, in, the, in the audience, Sarah was talking about coming with maybe the 
you know, there's some amendments to the Missouri Constitution. She may have a board, sorry, I, don't, I didn't know, I didn't say that. Okay, so, and then um, pay attention to learners um, because we have a lot of students, residents, fellows that work with us um, who have really provided um, amazing amounts of work on these projects and have helped move them along. Um, so for this one, the Regional Sexual Health Data Platform, this is something that really Ben Cooper and I've worked on since almost 2014 um, and is slow going, um, but we know that STI reporting laws um, and data fall short, right? What is the data I was showing you from the CDC? 2022, right? Yeah. Um, you can't get 2024 data from anybody right now. Um, you can barely get 2023 data right now. And test, this testing data from healthcare systems though, from BJC, from St. Mary's, from the FQHCs, can be used to evaluate care in a more timely manner. And so that's what this um, is, is proposing, working on, continuing to evolve with. This is a schematic of the ideas um, of how the data would flow, and, and this is very simplistic. There's lots of things going on. Um, but the goal is to really have all testing data negative tests and positive tests, because you can't really fully evaluate care if you aren't looking at how that care is distributed, right? So testing data is not reported to the state, only positive tests are reported to the state. So in order to, in order to do what we really need to do, involving evaluation, distribution of resources, going back to those, those justice questions, we need to evaluate all of testing. So some of the benefits of this are really to, our goal is to empower healthcare systems to look at their sexual health data, evaluate it, and make changes to reduce disparities. So we're talking about data governance that really is a, is a team. We want a team approach. Nobody is going to be in charge. We're all gonna put all our ideas together and improve the system. This is an example of the data we have from the data platform that's specific to BJC. I don't have the facilities labeled on here, but what you see in orange is the number of cisgender women tested for chlamydia, and then in red, these are the number of cisgender women that were tested for chlamydia and syphilis at the same time. So you can see what I'm talking about. Our red is ideal. The more red we see, the better. Of course, it's not gonna be 100%, but one of these is 4%. So that's a problem, right? So not ideal is that orange. So if you think about that one problem from a regional perspective, from a healthcare system perspective, what can you do to correct it? That's the sorts of thing that we want this data platform to inform and help us move forward. The next project I want to talk about is a syndemic approach to congenital syphilis. So this is the SYNC program, Syphilis Navigation Connection Hotline program. I did not come up with that, but I love it. The lead is St. Louis County. Our funding again, oh guess what, in the epidemic, right? Um, and we have um, a 2B MFM fellow who's going to help with evaluation. I, we have undergrads from the Gephardt Institute on Danforth campus um, who are interested in policy and healthcare system operations um, who, help with, who are gonna help with this this summer. Um, and it's already launched. Uh, we've launched it with the Christian um, Emergency Department. It's a soft launch. We're getting ready to do a blast email and flyer. Um, but this is sort of the workflow we worked out for the um, emergency departments that if they have someone of child, basically, of someone of childbearing potential or who is pregnant who has a positive syphilis test, I don't care if they actually have syphilis. If they have a positive syphilis test, we'll sort it out. They are to call a central number, leave the information, and that will be handled by the county. So, and then they need to go through and do the other things. Um, if someone is not capable of being pregnant or cisgender male, whatever, they still need to go through and manage them. Um, but the SYNC program will focus on those people of childbearing potential and who are pregnant with syphilis and will follow them from that phone call through until their RPR titers are dropping. 
So along the way, we will make sure they're being treated and managed correctly. We have a nurse practitioner and a, a nurse who can deliver and take bicillin to them to treat them where they are. We will have DIS involved for partner services. Actually, I have a slide. <laughs> so DIS will do partner services. It's very important that we find their partners and treat them. They also serve as health educators. A community health worker, I'm going to talk more about community health worker at the end of the talk, but community health workers are a key bridge between community and health and help, helping them to get services that they need. So this is really a holistic care model. And then our clinicians, and myself, nurse practitioner, and the nurse will review diagnosis and treatment. And then we're going to follow their RPR titers. We'll make sure they've had HIV testing, make sure they've had other STI testing, all of those things. And then we have a 2B um, maternal fetal medicine fellow who's going to work, write and conduct the program evaluation for this. And I think we have a new faculty. It's also really good at cost. So we may also try to analyze how much this costs. So next program. This is one that um, Laura Marks and Madeline McRae are spearheading. Um, it's a syndemic approach to caring for people with substance use disorder and by improving hepatitis C testing and linking them to care across our system. So this funding is from Gilead. So Laura tells me that um, for people that have, I'm going to get this wrong, basically screening people for substance, with substance use disorder that don't have regular health care or engagement with primary care don't get screening, right? So the goal only, and that only really happens in the outpatient arena, but yet we see so many of these patients inpatient. So the goal is to integrate screening and testing to the traditional, to non uh, in non-traditional settings to continued care. That is only happening now without a program to about 20% of the people with hepatitis C or B. So Laura has done some work. You're going to see this when you admit people with substance use disorder because of this study that showed the benefit and how many STIs and other related infections we pick up when we screen people who come in with a substance use disorder. So this is the epic order set that comes up for you and you may be like, oh, a box. But it does, you will find that she can detail you on how many more STIs you're gonna find. Um, and there is a dedicated nurse navigator to provide patient education and linkage to care services um, for patients diagnosed with HIV or viral hepatitis um, who have a history of past or present substance use. And then starting in a few weeks, um, this nurse navigator will routinely see inpatients diagnosed with HIV or the hepatitises who have um, the substance use history, providing them with education, helping them arrange outpatient appointments, giving them that linkage while they're still here, and will also be able to assist with transportation, right? A key social determinant of health is access to transportation. And then they're going a bit further. Working with our ob gyn colleagues, because pregnancy is such an important healthcare access point, to integrate ID docs into maternal fetal medicine management at the care clinic, uh, for people who are pregnant with substance use disorder and being able to be co-located to treat infections when people are coming to their prenatal appointments. Pretty exciting. And then lastly, the Sexual Wellness Clinic at Village Square. So this is also funded by In the Epidemic year to year. Um, it is a going to be a community-designed walk-in STI clinic located at Village Square in North St. Louis County and opening in late 2024. Why did we need another clinic? Well, this is just the ED volumes across the BJC system for gonorrhea and chlamydia tests in one year. Um, this is 6,000, okay? And I left the, the numbers, the facilities up there. BJH, the emergency department, right? Like, yeah, definitely 6,000 gonorrhea, chlamydia, or syphilis tests. Most of it's gonorrhea and chlamydia. Um, and then look at, so these marks, this is, um, this marks 10 tests a day, this marks five tests a day. You can see how many of those um, are above that. But look at Christian Northeast ED and the Christian 
I mean, sorry, Northwest ED and, and the Northeast ED, they are the next two after BJH and have a higher volume than BJH uh, emergency department of testing. So when we look at the location of those emergency departments, um, this is the Village Square building. There is also um, a social services area for patients living with HIV that has a food pantry and um, a hygiene closet and all the case management. Um, but this map of St. Louis City and County, um, the darker shaded areas um, are those areas with higher case rates of chlamydia as a marker of STI distribution. So again, you can see where North St. Louis City and County have the highest rates of chlamydia. And then the circles represent STI testing sites. And the star is where the new clinic is. So located in North County, in a high rate with high, uh, area with high STI rates, and in an area where there is lower density of STI testing sites, right? Most of our sites are in the central corridor. You can clearly see that. And not as many further up north. So that's why we needed a new, cl a new clinic. We needed this other aspect of this grant, which requires us to spend the first year focused on community surveys, interviews, establishment of community member advisory groups. So we are literally spending this whole first year listening to community. Our goal is holistic syndemic care. The team approach is built into this grant and to our plans. Our director of prevention, a case manager, a community health worker, actually Joan Ferguson, who's right there in the corner. Um, she now works full time on this project. And then we have partnerships with St. Louis County Department of Public Health, um, a BJC ob -GYN clinic that's um, located up north in one of the uh, Christian hospitals, and Planned Parenthood, all to help patients find care, because the, the RSTI clinic's kind of a one and done shop, right? They come in, it's a walk-in, its goal is no charge, but we want to holistically assess every patient for all the other care that they need, and then make sure that they get to those locations if they need additional health care, if they need social resources, that's why we have a community health worker to help them get there. So let me talk briefly about community health workers to kind of wrap this up. So a community health worker, and this is a definition on the Missouri State website, is a frontline public health worker who are trusted members of or have a close relationship and understanding of a community, the community served, and they serve as a link, a bridge between health and social services and the community to facilitate the access to those services. And they're actually quite more regularly found in chronic disease management. But I've found a lot of CHWs that are really interested in sexual health care. And so the question is, how can they, um, how can they benefit sexual health care and in order to help patients receive um, and improve their sexual wellness. So Joan and I are doing a little study. It's a qualitative examination of CHW experience in sexual health care. Um, and we've been interviewing CHWs for a while now. And the themes that have really come about are um, their desire to have more training in sexual wellness topics. So often the CHWs, like just about everybody in the United States, received really horrific sex ed when they were growing up, right? Abstinence only. If you're good, you don't get an STI, right? So that's what they learned. And what we want to see and what they want is more um, open, realistic, welcoming, and sex positive education. CHWs are undervalued in healthcare systems. So um, I talked to CHWs who recognized that someone with syphilis needed penicillin because their friend had had syphilis and needed penicillin, and then saw someone being treated with amoxicillin for, for, for syphilis, brought it up and got written up as being argumentative. I've talked to CHWs who are making um, barely a livable wage. Um, and I would point out, this is changing at WashU, but I would point out that at WashU there was one CHW category 
in H HR job classifications. If you ever had to go through this stuff, I've learned things I don't need to know, but there was one job classification. There was not a CHW1, CHW2, so there was no room for promotion and no room for really making more money than what they, that one job classification was, was um, giving them. So that is changing thanks to people who work with CHWs and have wanted that to improve. Um, and what I have to say is that CHWs really have a lot of new perspectives to offer in sexual health care. And I'm excited to have CHWs on these teams and to work with them and have them as colleagues. Um, and I can say that, um, that they have been uh, really great teachers of me too. Um, okay, so key elements of a syndemic approach to health care. I think we've hit on all of these. I think it's clear why these things have to happen. So we need to ensure quality care. There has to be evaluation in all, pro all these programs. You need to have a diverse team composition. The pr program must access for social, social vulnerabilities and have solutions for them. I'm not saying it's easy. You just need to start thinking through it. You have to learn from programs that are doing work in adjacent areas. So when we do things like um, how do we integrate CHWs into programs? We might look at our chronic disease um, public health departments to learn from that, right? Collaboration, involving community, paying them for their time is essential. And then always address prevention and stigma. So the more we talk and talk and talk, the more we push back against community standards mean you can't have certain advertisements in places where many people frequent, for example. And then lastly, I just want to thank the Prevention Training Center, um, the Data and Training Center at IPH, and as always, Team Reno. They're um, mostly proud of me and only occasionally embarrassed by me, so that's not too bad. <laughs> so, thanks. Time for questions, you may have to repeat them. So, we have time for some questions. Um, so, if you have any uh, questions for Dr. Reno, I uh, first of all want to thank Hillary for a really wonderful talk. Madeline. absolutely essential or, and I think you're on the call at like 11 tomorrow right where yeah. we're all talking together yeah 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 so um, yeah so as as MFM develops their protocol for syphilis and y'all are seeing patients in the clinics the the call tomorrow is really to make sure all this stuff is linked together in a big circle so oh I'm sorry um, given that um, that 70 percent of the counties right hold on 70% of counties, of people who prescribe you, um, substance use medical treatment would not prescribe to a pregnant person. So how are we going to work around that, right? So we have to get them to, to specialists, not specialists, we have to get them to care providers that will. So like the care clinic, the WISH clinic, um, that specifically see pregnant people with substance use um, would be very important. Mm 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yeah, I didn't touch on the international use of CHWs. Um, so the question was, you know, I spoke about doing or comment that I spoke about using uh, lessons from chronic disease, um, which is, I mean, the SYNC model, the SYNC program is really an HIV linkage to care but for syphilis, right? That's um, the goal of that. But uh, there is ample evidence um, and uh, programs, examples from uh, other countries on utilizing CHWs and indeed in sexual, um, when it comes to sexual health as well. Right, so why did, why did the s congenital syphilis rates increase and we've had racism and poverty and, and many of these other social determinants uh, for uh, all of history, right? So we think it has more to do with substance use, right? So if you look at the rates of syphilis um, in the 80s and 90s, they were also quite high. Um, and why? That was because of heroin, right? So, um, and then Again, as opioid use disorder has surged, you have seen people who are either having sex because they are trading it for drugs or money or housing or these other needed things, um, or perhaps that is just that's in the sexual network itself. So it does come down to sexual network. That's why you, we get the large number of HIV cases in Southern Illinois, right? Which, by the way, in 2021, had an out that same area had an outbreak of syphilis. Um, and it all had to do with opioid um, use and, be and syphilis not being transmitted by opioid use, but being transmitted in the sexual network of opioid users. Exactly. Elizabeth, how much of your cohort had rural patients in it? I can't remember. Yeah, so I mean, I think that, you know, the interaction of, the ju of having interactions with the justice system as a contributor to syphilis and congenital syphilis cases is not very well defined, and our ability to collect that data is somewhat limited. How'd you know that was Christian? It's not labeled. So, so, so yes. Yeah, so why? So, so this is pretty striking. It is absolutely striking. And yes, and we have been having more and more discussions. I define the right people, and I found the right people, and they have. They have said what has been unsaid, which is we don't test for syphilis because we don't want to deal with a positive test. 
So that's why they have a freaking, where is it? Where's, wherever that phone number is. That's why they have that phone number. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I thought that was really important, right? I mean, they need backup. They need, and they need, like, I'm like, and when I say, bring me your syphilis cases, I am 100%, you know, honest about that. And I think being met with, like, I'm like, that enthusiasm can be helpful, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's great. That's great. I'll put that in parenthesis. <laughs> so, so I mean, they could take care of people up there. They do. I mean, it, that's not the problem. It's just when it came to HIV testing and syphilis testing, they don't want to do it because they're working shifts. They're overwhelmed. I mean, and they they don't know what to. They didn't have a follow up system because guess what? BJC took that away at the end of COVID. Okay. I think we've caused enough trouble. Uh, <laughs> thank you very much.